Hey friends across the world, this is Linda coming to you from Wausau, Wisconsin in the USA. I'm a little late coming on, like a whole day, <laughs> a day and a half an hour, but you know, things happen and God is at work in so many ways that we don't, can't explain, don't understand, but we go with the flow because we have faith. And we're trusting that whatever happens in life, God has a plan because he said so in Romans 8, 28, where it says, God works all things together for the good for those that love him and are called according to his purpose. So if you're called today, if you don't know if you're called, if you'd like to be called for God's purpose, please tune in for the next 25 minutes or so. And we're going to talk about faith versus fear. Father, open the hearts and the minds of those who might be afraid today, who might be struggling with an issue or questioning what's real or don't know what the future holds. We've all been there, Lord, and help them to listen and to hear your word that they might have faith instead of fear and let go of the anxiety for your glory and pour your grace on them in Jesus name. Amen. So I'm very excited about this message today. I have a friend who we have known for about 10 years and he has struggled with mental health, with substance abuse, with alcoholism. And we run a sober house that is to be help people stay sober. It's for homeless people who have substance abuse issues and mental health disorder. We've been doing this since 2001. It is now 2022. And it will be our last month of this house. This is a God thing because one of the residents who came in in 2010, 12 years ago, kicked the habit. Initially, he struggled and struggled and struggled. And about six years ago, he finally got serious. He came to the house that we are now operating. We had several houses at the time. He came to this house and he has been kind of the, fa the godfather, <laughs> so to speak, of the house. He's been the stable one. He has watched people in the seven, eight beds that we had in this house, people come and go for the last six years. He has helped many of them. And the miracle of this, after six years of sobriety and having a great job and getting employee of the month many times, he is buying our house. Not our house. We sold the house a few years ago to someone else and now that person is selling the house to our resident and we are so proud of him. In the meantime, another fellow who was in that came into the house about the same time struggled more, had more mental health issues, had had a stroke, had a brain problem that he wasn't able to think straight, had physical limitations so he couldn't do the work he used to do, had other kinds of issues, child support and back taxes. He had gotten so far behind because of his illnesses and missing work over the years that it caused him a deep depression and he could not stay sober in that house to the point where finally we had to say this isn't working. We've got other people who need sobriety and you're not doing it. So we had to ask him, oops, sorry. We had to ask him to leave another homeless person with an addiction that needs a house. We have had to ask him to leave. Where did he, he, he could have gone to the Salvation Army, which takes homeless people in. They did have a bed, but he had been drinking and he didn't want to get sober and he didn't want to go there because he would have had to humble himself and live, stay with other people that he didn't know and he wouldn't do it. 
So he stayed on the street for several days and the rain came and it was pouring down on him and it was cold. And he decided that it was too much and he was going to end his life. This was just last week, two weeks ago almost. God is so faithful. And he was laying on the rocks that he had fallen on as he contemplated jumping off the bridge in his drunken stupor that he had tried to drink himself to death and hadn't been successful. He heard a voice calling his name, Brian, Brian. And he heard this, it was faint to begin with. And the voice kept getting louder and louder. I can't wait to tell my friend Laura this because the same thing happened to her. And it kept calling. And all of a sudden, he had kind of an anger problem and kind of swore a lot. I'm not going to repeat what he said. But he got up and said, who the heck is there? <laughs> Using much more um, graphic words. And he didn't hear anybody, but he realized there was nobody there. So he got up and he stumbled back to the house where he had lived, where all of his stuff still was, and he called me. I was with a client because I'm a counselor, and I obviously couldn't answer the phone, but I knew nobody else called me from the house phone but him. I knew it was him, but I couldn't answer the phone. So I called back as soon as I got done with my client, and nobody answered there. Soon I got a message from somebody. You need to get him out of here. He's drunk. I'm like, I can't. I've got clients. And a little while longer, not too long after that, I got another contact. And the gal who lives there is a certified nursing assistant. And she's doing really well also. Got a job after she came and is doing well. She said he's calling 911 which in the United States is the ambulance. He called the ambulance on himself, knowing the police would come and everybody would come. They took him to the hospital. He was in intensive care in the cardiac unit because he had had some kind of an episode. His heart wasn't working right. They didn't know. His brain wasn't working right. He didn't know what day it was. Um, he was having all kinds of physical problems. He had a blood clot in his lung and they quickly you know took care of him he was suicidal still wanted to kill himself so they put him on suicide watch and had someone sitting with him all the time for the next 24 hours and then they called the mental health unit in town and they asked them to come and evaluate him and see what could be done if they had a place for him and they put him in a place but the hospital thought it was a intensive care unit sort of mental health where he would get medical monitoring and get his medication supervised and instead they put him in more of an outpatient thing where he had no medication they didn't bring any medication so from the time he came in on Saturday I blew a gasket on Tuesday because he still hadn't had his blood thinners and all of his psychiatric medication and his heart medication and his blood pressure medication, which obviously was not going to help a blood clot in his lung or, and his blood thinners. So I was very angry. I was very upset. And I advocated, and they got him his meds, and he's doing better. But he was supposed to be released on Thursday to being homeless. And back on the street or at Salvation Army. And, you know, there's, it's, he's giving plasma now. He's donating plasma to save other people's lives. And they begged him to come back because he's got really good plasma <laughs> and a lot of it when he gives. And if he went to Salvation Army, he would no longer be able to give because he's at risk being around all those people who might have serious diseases so he was going to lose that opportunity he doesn't have a job can't work right now 
what to do. So we prayed. We have a very beautiful house. We have another fellow that we took in, another veteran, and Brian's a veteran. And we we talked to him. He's on, he was going to be on the transplant li list because he has already, I'm going to cry again, outlived his expected lifespan by six years. He had six bypasses in 2006, and they only thought he'd live maximum 10 years. He's had like 26 stents put in his heart. And our, our friend Saul, um, who is an evangelist in Pakistan, just had, I think, a very similar heart surgery. This guy had six bypasses and over 25 stents put in his heart. So he lives here, walking on borrowed time, not knowing if he's going to live today, and he lives every day to the fullest. And we decided we're going to open another part of our basement. We've got a beautiful, huge house. We had four kids living here. And there was plenty of room. So we opened. We're, we're going to go talk to him today. He doesn't even know. But we're going to go talk to him today and offer him a place in our home so that he can live. He heard that voice, and he realized that voice was God calling out to him, giving him a chance. Prior to this, the reason I know he couldn't stay sober is because he had not made that God connection. He did not trust God with the things that were troubling him, his health, his finances, his life in general. And this morning, from the place where he is now staying at, the hospital where he is, he sends to me Hebrews 11.1. 1. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for the evidence of things not seen. He has do downloaded the daily Bible, and he also has my Bible, my uh, meditation book that I wrote, and he's reading that as well. I don't think he has it today because he left the house so quick. And I'm like, wow. I said, how cool is that? What are you hoping for and praying for? And my expectation was for him to say, I need a place to live, and I need a job. What did he say? I'm praying for good health and well-being for all my family and friends, especially you and Ralph. That's my husband. That's faith. He seems to know that God's going to take care of him now. He's going to take care of him. He didn't even ask for that. It's as though he has the knowledge now after hearing that voice that God's going to take care of him. And I can pretty much guarantee you that he does not expect that we're going to invite him in because we were the ones that made him leave so that he could hit bottom and turn to God. We don't ever like to see somebody having to hit bottom. But we all had to at some point. Well, not everybody. Some people just grew up in wonderful homes and realized that turning their life over to the Lord was the logical thing to do. And it was a wonderful thing because they had great parents and they saw a great life. Others of us <laughs> had, had a great life. I had wonderful parents and they loved me. But when I got into alcohol and drugs, through really some fault of their own, because alcohol was very optional, and we all drank. Even when I was young, it was okay for me to drink. And I got addicted to alcohol um, pretty early and then went into the drug scene. So it turned me, I had to hit bottom, and I did. I hit bottom a few years later which led me 46 years ago to come here to turn to the Lord and say, God, help me. So here I am. 
doing what God called me to do, telling this to you today, so you could have hope in the future and know that no matter what you're going through, God is there calling out to you saying, hello, hello, John, hello, Susie, hello, Linda, hello, Chris, hello, Ralph, hello, Brian, I'm here. Don't worry about it. Quit stressing about it. I got you. I got your back. I created you, Jeremiah 29, 11. I fashioned and formed all your inward parts. I made you for me to serve me. And what that what does that mean to serve God? Does that mean we're slaves? Well, it kind of says that. But what God means is that he has created me for a purpose. I thought I'd turn that off. He created me for a purpose to do his good will. And his good will is helping you, being here today, giving you the message to quit stressing and to trust God and to be here for the people that we've been here for for all these years. Because that's our my calling. That's Ralph's calling. That's our roommate Chris is calling right now to say, yes, come in. We're going to open our home to you to give you a chance to walk with God and to do his will and to be the blessing that God created him to be so that he could change the world the way you and I have and can and do every day. So hear, hear me, this is important. We change the world every day, be it for good or for bad. The people that you have opportunity to impact, you are either going to be, like the Bible says, for good or for evil. You're either going to help them or you're not. You're going to encourage them or you're going to discourage them. You're going to support them and exhort them or you're going to bring them down and push them away and say, go be warm and filled. What are we going to do? to help people. I don't know if this guy's ready that keeps calling me and calling me since 6 o'clock this morning. He's homeless. I know he's homeless. But he also, not sure he's at the bottom. I don't know. And we're going to talk to him and we're going to find out. Because sometimes Jesus was homeless. He only had the shoes on his feet. Now, why would Jesus be homeless? To show us what it was like. And that even in that, he trusted the Father. And he did what God was calling him to do, what his Father was calling him to do, even until death. What are we willing to do by faith in the Son of God? For him who gave him, who loved us and gave himself for us, and gives us the power to do the same. Are we willing to do it? So a couple more verses on faith. And whatever you ask in prayer, you will receive if you have faith. Oh, is that true? Are we really going to get whatever we ask for? Well, it also says, if you ask with the right motives, do we have the right motives to ask for God? Give me this, give me that, give me wealth so I can go buy a new Cadillac, so I can go and, you know, travel the world and just have fun and do my own thing. Is God going to give me that just because I ask for it? And sometimes God does give us what we think we want and then we get it and it's like, oh, wasn't what I thought it was going to be. Like this motorhome thing, if you've been following me, I wanted a motorhome for 35 years. I got the motorhome. God gave us a great deal on the motorhome. I got the motorhome. We took it out for 14 hours. Wasn't what I thought. Too much, too big, too confusing, too, too, oh, costly. Everything about it was more than what I thought, and it wasn't my dream that I had imagined. And God said, well, I gave it to you. 
because you needed to see that this isn't the best for you. What's best for you is to be content, like Paul. In whatever circumstance I have, I am in, he says, I have learned to be content. Paul was beaten and, and you know, chastised and homeless and in prison and all of these things. And yet, he said, in all these things, I've learned to be content. What did Jesus say? Father, forgive them. They know not what they're doing. All of these things took faith that God was at work in their lives. He's at work in your life. Look around you. Be grateful. Our negativity, our anxiety, our stress comes from our lack of gratitude for what we have. Our lack of belief in what God created us to be, what we're good at, the three G's. What we're good at, we're good at things that God made us good at so we could help other people with those gifts that he's given us. And what are our goals for the day? Our goals are to listen to God, to stay close to him, to meditate on his word, to have faith. Hebrews 11:6. And without faith, it is impossible to please him for whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards them who seek him. You don't want to be without stress? Turn to God. You don't want to be all frustrated? Turn to God. You don't want life to fall apart for you? Turn to God. Because a lot of times, not always, sometimes life falls apart so that we can trust God in front of somebody. And show them. Our roommate Chris. Amazing man. Heart. Every day. He comes up from his bedroom downstairs. Very few days. It's not like this. Because he's in pain. Or he's sick. Almost every single day. He comes up. It's going to be a great day. I'm going to go to work. I'm going to help people. It's going to be a great day. Every day is on borrowed time for him. And yet that's his attitude. Why has he lived six years beyond what they expected? Because of that. Because he chooses to get up looking at the positive and hoping for the best and believing that God is going to get him through another day and let him go out and ride his little monkey, which is this little motorcycle that he just loves. It's 150 miles to the gallon. He's been on that two, three times a day every day, every all summer long, for as long as he could. Last summer, he had a bigger bike, and he couldn't ride it. He hardly ever rode it because it was too big. It was too heavy, and physically he couldn't handle it. His heart couldn't handle it. And then he'd get chest pains, and they've told him if he has one more episode it's over because they can't do surgery. He has no vessels left, no nothing. They can't put another stent in. It'll blow everything up. But that's, here's another thing. Unbelievable. When we went with him about his heart uh, transplant, when we went to that consultation, the surgeon said the strangest thing. Never seen anything like it. Your heart has rewired itself because the vessels that weren't working, you grew new ones and they went to other places. I was like, how the heck does that work? Well, come on now. If you're a believer, you know how it works. So why are we not trusting God with the little things? With how we're going to pay the next bill? What does the Bible say? It says, don't worry about what, what you will wear or what you're going to eat. Look at the flowers of the field, the lilies of the field and the birds of the air. They don't sow. They don't go out there and plant themselves. Neither do they reap. But even Solomon, in all of his glory, was not arrayed, was not dressed like one of these birds or one of these flowers. Have you ever watched those coral reef videos? of all those different kind of fish 
Have you ever watched the National Grid geographic things of the birds and all the flowers and the intricacy? That's what God does. Why? For our benefit, for our amazement to go, oh my goodness, oh my God, OMG, you did that. If you can do that, what are you doing for me today? What do I have to worry about? I'm going to flip back here. I haven't even looked at this today, but every week I kind of try, not, not to PR this, but I want you to know what God can do for you. This is my meditation book that God gave to me to help me because I would write down these problems. I am stressed out. I don't know how to handle this. God, help me. And he would speak to me, and I start to write it down because it got, it was so amazing. So what I do every week is I pick this book up. I've got 365 meditations, and I usually just pick it up maybe two seconds before I go online or maybe just right now, and I flip it open, and I see if it's relative to what I'm preaching on. Here we go. Go figure. April 20th. Faith in the wind. <laughs> go figure. My challenge for that day, here's what I was, I was struggling with. Many of us struggle with faith. How do you believe in something that you can't hear or smell or see consider the wind on a calm day you don't see it because nothing is moving you don't smell it because there is nothing there blowing around and you can't hear it because everything is still yet when the wind blows everything changes in fact the wind can be so powerful that it can rip houses off their foundation and even damage or destroy brick buildings god is the wind he blows about our lives, and though we can't see or hear him, unless he calls out to us when we're in stress, we can feel his power when the wind blows. Have we come to believe in the power of God as much as we believe in the power of the wind? And the scripture God gave me that day, oh, <laughs> I just quoted this. Couldn't have told you what verse. And why worry about your clothing? Look at the lilies of the field and how they grow. They don't work or make their clothing, yet Solomon in all his glory was not dressed as beautifully as they are. Matthew 6, 27 and 28. Now you know where that verse is, and I quoted a different version than this one. My prayer was, God, you are the wind. I feel it, I know it, and I want it blowing through my hair. I want you blowing through my life with the power that can restore me to sanity. When we are st un under stress, anxious, fearful, we don't, our chemical in our brain is not right. And our heart pounds, we get sick to our stomach, we get stress in our back and our neck and our shoulders and our headache. And some people have heart attacks and other people have strokes. Do you want to go there today? Or do you want to be at peace and serenity? It is up to you. So when that bill comes in that mail and there's no food on the table and you're hungry, do you want to trust God to give you the strength to be hungry for a couple of days perhaps and to bring you food when you need it? Or do you want to be stressed out, anxious, and upset? It's up to you. Here's what God said to me after I went through this. I'm probably going to cry. I always do. My child, go outside and look around you. Feel the air. Listen to the birds. Smell the aroma of the flowers in the rain. I did that. I continue to clothe the flowers and care for the birds and grow the plants and move the waters. I can use all of these things for good or for destruction, but it is my plan that all things would be good for mankind. I am able to do my will in you as you have the faith to believe and surrender your will in me. 
Let me show you what I can do with a surrendered life. You will be amazed. My response was, God, bring it on. I'm waiting. How about you? Are you waiting for him? Are you seeking him with a pure heart? What does he say? Seek me with all your heart and I will be found. Are you seeking him diligently? Or are you just being surface and trusting yourself and worrying about the future and letting the evil one come in and try to get you to not trust? Let's pray. God, there are people that needed to hear this message like I did today. Move in their hearts, move in their lives. Help them, Lord, to turn to you and to do what you have called them to do. Firstly, to surrender their fears and accept your grace and your spirit. Let them feel your spirit. Let them hear your voice crying out to them. I am here. Look for me. I will be found. Thank you, Lord, that you speak through us, that you move through us, that you use us. You have called us for your good pleasure to help others and to be part of the body that works together. None of us can do it alone. We can all do it together. In your name, amen. Thank you for watching. I know you've been blessed today. Accept it. Be alert. Be at peace. Have a great day, night, wherever, whenever you are. Love you all.